I guess when that other tape ran out, I started to tell about the Dick Albright crew. We weren't as close to them as we were uh, with the Beals crew, but uh, I got to know them after the war. I met them. I didn't mention that, but uh, they were on this mission to Dresden with us. And that's when we were in carry our bomb base full of the incendiary bombs. And one of the fire bombs we called them. We burnt out Dresden. And, uh, but they got a hit, as I recall, and uh, I should read that, read his story, but uh, it hit in, in the bomb bay and started those incendiaries on fire. They immediately, they didn't blow up, of course, because they, they were just, they were incendiaries. I guess that's the ones I was telling you about. You, we'd drop them and they'd hit on a roof or something. They were so hot, they'd burn their way right on down through into the next floor. And, so forth, and uh, they uh, were just burning, burning bad, and, and real quick. So they just ordered you just. Uh, Albright told them all to bail out. So the whole crew bailed out, and they all bailed out safely. But uh, uh, a couple of them, I think, got buggered up when they hit the ground. But they were all taken prisoners and put in a little. German jail of some sort in a little town there, and, but one of the guys on the crew could speak some German, and so he kind of conversed with him, and this one German officer, for some reason or another, kind of befriended him, and uh, it seemed like they just kept, he kept moving him from one little prison to another around from here and there until the war ended, and then he handed him his had him in his pistol and said, "No, you're my. Uh, I'm your prisoner." But uh, I suppose he was looking for a favor from their side then. But they couldn't do anything for him because he. Uh, they were just whisked away and taken home right away. But uh, that kept him out of the big stalags and the great big uh, prisons. And uh, this uh, navigator on this crew was named Carl Runge. And uh, he took up a very, very detailed history of that whole ordeal, and it's very interesting. And uh, we heard at uh, one of our last newsletters from the '46 that there's a good possibility that it would make be, will be made into a movie. So it won't be for a while. They're doing a lot of pre-work on it. So if you ever see a movie that fits that pattern, you'll know that uh, I was on that raid and the uh, same day they were shot down. But uh, an interesting part of it, uh, my neighbor found out that a guy that lives in Weeping Water, just five miles from where I live, was, uh, was a gunner on that crew, and I didn't know it until just a few years ago. But he was kind of a private guy and that uh, Albright crew had uh, crew reunions all over the country. They were very active. I think it's Carl Runge was kind of the instigator of the whole thing. But uh, he was guy from Weeping Water wouldn't go to the meeting, so they decided to have a crew reunion in Lincoln, which is just about 25 miles from where he lives. And uh, we heard about it, so I went up and visited with the crew. They were having dinner, but I said, oh, I didn't want to interrupt them, but I said, told him who I was and that I had some, a lot of the, all the briefing sheets and stuff and everything, but uh, this Carl Runge, he grabbed me right away and sat right down beside him and he wouldn't, he just kept talking the whole time. And, uh, but he's a guy, he works for one of the movie studios in California after he got out of the war, so it was kind of a, interesting situation, but uh, hopefully that'll go, go into a movie someday. Albright's uh, crew's plane was named Ole Miss Agnes. I suppose if they made a movie out, they'd have to change it and make it something fancy, but that's what it, the plane was named. On uh, 9th of May, told us we were going to take a victory flight over Europe and uh, to go see all the sites. 
But they brought out a bunch of people from London that had been working in the office, men and women and so forth, and I don't know how many we loaded up, but quite a bunch. And we took off from what over Shaw Grove, England, over Rygate, England, Dungeness, England, Capgrisness, France, Wilderness, France, Brussels, Belgium, Lycolot, Belgium, that was an Air Force base. But there were different points of interest, air bases and bridges and all that kind of stuff. I've got, or everybody on the route got one, on the flight got one of these, and there's all kinds of explanation of what to look for and what was done at each of the place. Maas River, Aachen, Germany. Durham, Germany, Cologne, Germany, Wesling, Bonn, Germany, here I'll just read one of them for Bonn, Germany, here as the Cologne plain ends, the banks of the Rhine become steeper, after leaving Bonn, Watch for the Rhine closely. The next permanent type bridge, which you will, you will see, is the famous Remagen Bridge. But uh, it was a lot of fun. Koblenz, Germany. Frankfurt on the Main, Germany. Canal, Germany. Osh. Oschaffenberg, Germany. I can't pronounce the German name. Mannheim and Ludwigshafen. Kaiserslautern. Trier. Bastogne, Belgium. We're on our way back now. St. Hubert, Belgium. Givet, Belgium. Valencia, in this sense. France and Bonn, France. It was, we flew, I can't remember, we flew a very low altitude so they could see, you could just see everything. Uh, I have two grandsons that took German as a language in high school and the whole class went over to Germany a few years ago for a, a trip sightseeing trip, and it's, I don't know how many towns, uh, different cities they visited, but they took a video camera with them, and when they got home, they were showing them to me, and all those towns and cities had been built up back to the original old architecture, and just like nothing had ever happened. And I told the boys, I said, I cannot believe that they've got those built back so quick, I says. One of the grandsons looked at me and says, Grandpa, he says, that was over 50 years ago. And it kind of put me in my place. I can't remember for sure, but I think it was probably about a five and a half or six hour flight. But they would send a bunch of K rations along in case anybody wanted to, something to nibble on and also some uh, cans of fruit juice, canned fruit juice. And our crew. Uh, kind of got together and got their heads together and I said, you guys, none of you guys drink any of the fruit juice. Let the, let them all have it back there. Well, of course, I guess the drink, women would drink a little bit too much and you'd have to use a potty. Well, all we had, you know, was a funnel on a tube in uh, Bombay. You'd have to stand, stand on the catwalk and hang on to one of the ropes there. So whenever some woman would go in there, they'd shut the doors on the both ends of the Bombay, and one of the guys would call us up in the cockpit and say, we got a live one in there. For some reason or another, we had to make that plane go up and down like that <laughs> for a ways. <laughs> you knew they'd have to be hanging on in there with both hands, but these guys called back and said, well, they looked pretty frustrated when they came out of there. But of 
course, we were only kids, 20 years old, still having fun, you know. Especially since the war was over. We turned back into kids in a hurry. I guess I can't remember too much what went on the time, between the time the war was over and the time we headed for home. But one thing I can't remember, uh, we all bought bicycles. I don't remember we'd go to town or someplace and we could always buy a bicycle. Of course, as the guys left, why some of them would become available and then we'd ride bikes into uh, Sudbury horse around there, but a lot of guys would spend too much time in the pubs and they'd send a truck down and load up the guys and also all the bicycles and haul them back up to the base and you had to go hunt your bicycle each time. But when uh, you get close to time to go home, uh, why? We never got along too good with English people. I mean, they didn't didn't like us and so forth for I suppose good reasons. But anyway, they were kind of standing around like vultures waiting to pick up what was left. And so I don't know how many hundred bicycles we took them all out on the runway. We stacked up our bicycles in a great big row, and they took a half track and run up and down over them, just smashed the heck out of all of them. That was kind of a mean thing to do, but. Uh, that's what we did. After we got more serious about getting ready to go home, we started uh, you know, getting rid of stuff and everything, but then they, again, they put doors or something in the bottom of the bomb bays and they loaded our plane with a lot of records and stuff from headquarters and everything. I don't know what all was in there, but it wasn't clear for but then they assigned us, let's see, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. It's like 11 passengers to ride back with us, plus their gear. And then they made us, we had to teach them ditching. See, a B-17 has a inflatable life raft up in the top that you can pull it open up there and, and punch, pull a, CO2 cylinder and it'll plate that life raft and we had, had to learn ditching procedures in case we would have to ditch in the channel or something over there we're flying and so we had to practice and teach all these guys that were riding with us all the procedures for ditching and it was hot one day over there one guy that was riding home with us was a captain and he'd come in like he was gonna like he was in charge. Well, <laughs> of course that didn't go over with Bert or me either one, but we let him know that the pilots were in charge of that airplane and he was just another passenger and he wasn't going to do these ditching procedures and they said, well, you either do them with the rest of the guys or you're you're off this ride. You're going to have to get you another plane to ride in. So he did. It was a hot day and he was down in there <laughs> trying to get out and he I don't know, the May West also it not only the place itself, but it has another package of dye marker where you throw out in the ocean, it'll make the ocean bright yellow. Some way he was sweating down there and he busted that packet over. <laughs> he was one yellow mess down there <laughs> trying to get <laughs> yeah, the guys really got a kick out of that. I guess I'm kind of drawing up blanks here now, but uh, what, I don't know. They, we took off and we flew up to northern Scotland. I can't remember the name of the place, but the weather kind of socked in there and we had to stay several days. It seemed, it seemed like it was four or five days. We sat there and just messed around, no place to go or anything. We'd walk over to the ocean and look around but the weather wasn't good there either but finally the weather broke and we took off for Iceland and that was our first leg of our journey and uh, that was kind of uneventful but that was kind of an interesting place uh, I think we just we stayed got in there and stayed overnight one night and took off the next day but uh, as I remember it was all 
lava type rock wherever the air base was we couldn't go any place and I picked up a few pieces of that lava I think I've still got them at home little pieces just souvenirs but as I remember it was kind of like steam coming out in places and uh, it was a pretty desolate place the area we were in I, mean, I suppose there were better parts of it the next leg of our trip was from Iceland to Greenland we took off and kind of a scary thing really because you're heading out with those old war weary birds and nothing but water as far as you could see of course and it was out quite a while and we got to uh, well, I don't know how far out and boy you started seeing these little icebergs floating around and, and the farther you went the more they got and there was just icebergs and finally it just turned into a solid ice glacier but boy there's no way you could ever even ditch in there they were so close together and the same way you know I guess you could if you got onto the glacier far enough it got to where you could but we heard a couple planes call in that they were having trouble and they were probably going to have to ditch on the ice pack there were quite a few planes buried up there maybe you've read some of the stories about them they were they would sink down in this ice pack and they dug way down and got out got out some perfectly good planes and restored them from up there and anyway the farther on you went uh, you had uh, in Greenland had some big fjords that went up back up in there and uh, that's the way they built the airfield they went up this steep fjord steep rock walls on both sides and they blasted out the side of this fjord up in there and made a narrow runway of course it was a solid rock wall on one side water off the other side and uh, the runway went uphill. You come up the fjord and then landed and had to taxi uphill. And, uh, but the problem was if it was socked in, you had to find this fjord and find the right one and get under the soup and fly between the water and this fjord in there. And it was kind of socked over. Of course, we were always giving Kelly a hard time that we weren't in the right place and everything, but they had briefed the pilots that said halfway up the fjord was a hump in there. They called it a saddleback and it says, if you is socked in that close, you're, you're down on the water going up there, you might have to pull up into the clouds but hold your bearing and then let right back down again and you'll be all right. But uh, So Bert and I, we were right on the water going up through there Kelly didn't know that was there, and we hollered on the phone, Kelly, we're in the wrong fjord. There's an end ends up here. He could, Kelly could see that. <laughs> we hopped up over it, and we were on our way. But we had always had something going on. Oh, when we left Iceland, another thing. We, we took off not too far, big intervals, but I could spot a couple of head planes way out ahead of us. And Kelly gave us a heading, and finally I called up Kelly. And I said, Kelly, look out there to your left. See those planes? And I said, they're not going exactly the same heading where we are. And he said, well, we're going to beat them there, he says, because they're flying a great circle course, and we're, we're going cutting across. You know, as you go around the circle, you can, it, it's a long way around because of the curvature of the earth. But we're, he gave us a course, and uh, the right way. He says, don't you boys worry. He talked in his southern drawl. He put us right in there, right on the dot. You know, everybody was getting kind of worried. And I was the first one to see Greenland. And you could kind of see it sticking up out of the ice, big uh, ice packs up there. The next day, taking off there was a piece of cake. Good boy. It was downhill. Of course, you want to be flying before you got to the water because <laughs> that would have been a cold splash up there, I'll tell you. Of course, from there, we headed out for Newfoundland, Newfoundland on the next leg and uh, made it in there with no problems. Stayed over there a night and then headed for Bradley Field, Connecticut. They told us how fast we were supposed to fly, but 
we didn't pay any attention. We put it up. We were really mobile, and I think we about probably about burned up those engines getting in there to, to Bradley Field. But we got in there way ahead of everybody else. From Bradley Field, they sent us to different set uh, places. There were four of us that were sent from there to uh, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. It's Sherwood Collins from Dwight, Kansas. James M. John Jones from Burlington, Kansas. Boyd Clements to Elmwood and Archie Critchfield from Fair to Fairfield, Nebraska. Archie uh, is, is living in Lincoln now. I run into him. One day he came down to golf at the woods and we got to talking and suddenly realized that we knew each other for a long time back. But let's see, that was the 14th of July, 45, we were sent to Fort Leavenworth and then we had to report back to Fort Leavenworth the 16th of August, 1945. So we had a 30-day leave to go home after that. From uh, when we went back to Fort Leavenworth, then they sent us by troop train back down to Tampa, Florida. Drew Field at Ta Drew Field at Tampa, and there we sat around to be waiting to be discharged. Uh, we just didn't have much to do but sit around. I don't, know, I don't know why it took them so long, but we had to have physicals and all this and that. But we just have to check in at the base rather than stay out there with the mosquito place. Kelly and I went out in the we call it, it was Davis Island in the bay there at Tampa, St. Petersburg, and we got a little apartment out there and we stayed out there and would check in at the base. But uh, that was had a lot of fun there. Beaches weren't filled up in Florida at that time. You could run the beaches and now you can't even get to them the last time I was down there. I was sitting around down there, a bunch of the pilots went over to the FFA, or and uh, applied for uh, our pilot ratings, civil aeronautics pilot ratings, and it was all we had to do was take our record of our flying and so forth and our to show that we have the 1091 rating and evidence of our physical, uh, a late physical, and they'd issue us a, a pilot's license. It was that easy. This is this is mine here, and uh, issued February 6, 1946. We applied for it, and that's when I got it, but. Here it says, commercial pilot, airplane, Malta engine, land. So I had a commercial Malta engine license. Never did get to use it, but I had it anyway. I kind of thought that's my, what I might do for a living, but it didn't work out. After we finally got discharged down there, another kid and I, Sherwood Collins, uh, can't remember. I think he was. I believe he was a navigator. But we got kind of horsing around. So we were. He was from Dwight, Kansas. So he and I went over to uh, New Orleans and spent about a week there on our way home. That was kind of a lot of fun seeing the old French Quarter and this and that. But and he and I were sitting at the bar there one night, and some guys spotted us. See our our group came back earlier than most of the groups because uh, our group was supposed to come back and get take a little leave and then train in B-29s and go to, to the Pacific. So we came back early and some, I think there was some Pan American Airlines guys spotted us and wanted to know if we wanted a job and they said, well, yeah, but we're going to go home for a couple of weeks and then we'll get in touch with you. Well. That didn't pan out because there were thousands of 
a pilot milling around within a few weeks. Yeah, I guess I'll kind of call that good for maybe I'll think of some more things later on, but uh, I can insert them in. But uh, I may show you a little bit about our crew after we got home after many years. We, some of us got together again. First time we tried to get the crew together, we met at New Orleans, and uh, Bert Ward and his wife, Kelly and his wife, and Don and I met down there. We had a very enjoyable time there in New Orleans. That was our first get-together. I did get to see Bert a couple of times, and we stopped to see him one time in, uh, when he lived in Wichita, and then another time he was up here on the coast in, in Texas. And then we saw him at, uh, oh yeah, I was trying to think where it was. It was Ardmore, Oklahoma. Bert would work for a heavy contractor and he'd go, go out on his big job as a, as a superintendent. And he was building a big church there in uh, Ardmore when we stopped to see him one time. Yeah, Bert and Doris had one kid. We were married and had one kid before uh, we went overseas. And I think Doris and, and her boy came down to see us. I believe it was at, Drew, at uh, Alexander, Louisiana, I believe, before we went overseas. I remember Kelly and I bought at Christmas and bought uh, their boy a little kind of like an officer's uniform. Our uh, <coughs> most successful reunion was later on. <coughs> Uh, Prozinski was help, help, a lot helpful in getting it going and uh, called Bert, but they just weren't too well and just decided they couldn't travel. So I says, Bert, what if we come down to Mountain Home and see you? And he was all thrilled about that. So we all went down there and we had a pretty darn good turnout, the best one we ever had. But this is Jim Wisely and his wife. They're both gone now. Of course, that's myself and Donna. Walt Kelly and Alice, and Big Slim Holcomb, he was not too thin in those days, oh, and his wife, Bert and Doris, and Jonesy, Charlie Jones and his wife, Jeanette, and uh, we really had a good time. We had another one out in uh, Las Vegas later on. And uh, we had a pretty fair turnout that time. And, uh, but Doris had passed away, and Bert found an old school made of his, and he got married out there. So we all got to get in on his second go around out there. And that was a lot of fun. And Jones's boy was out there, and he was a joy because he kind of a ringleader and got us old farts a going and took us to shows and made us get up and go and uh, we really enjoyed him. We did get a little newspaper press out of the, the Baxter Bulletin at Mountain Home. Uh, just, that gives us the date on there, September 27, 1989. Of course, that shows our crew. That other one was before, and this was the after of our crew. Uh, yeah, while we were there in Mountain Home at the uh, first reunion, the local radio station sent a gal out and interviewed us. We got a tape of that. And also I got some video of that, so I think I'm going to kind of call this good for now. I may add later a little bit of the video of our crew in later life and uh, any other tidbits that I think of was, but I'm forgetting more than I'm remembering nowadays, so we'll probably call this good. One more. Uh, at Mountain Home there, I took my uniform along and, and that date I could still get into it so I put the blouse and hat on and 
come in and you know the darn enlisted guys wouldn't salute me anymore. I don't know why not, but we had a ball there. Well, I still keep thinking things. I didn't really tell what our guys did after the war. Big Slim Holcomb, he worked for, I think it was Safeway for all his life in Texas. Jim Wisely, he started his own insurance business out in Orange, California, very successful. Don Simmons, he had a nursery over in Decorah, Iowa. Charlie Jones, he went back to South Carolina and did farming. He had cattle, he raised uh, tobacco, and then he was a mail carrier for there, many years there. Pollock, he went to back up to Minnesota and uh, was a lighting, industrial lighting salesman for many years. He, he, I went up to see him once to one of the reunions up there. He had him name himself the Polish Lamplighter, and he'd go around and beep his horn at the different places where he'd sell lighting. Rod Hildebrand, I'm not sure. I think his family, or he had a, a building supply business or something. I'll have to ask Rod. I talk to him about every year, but I never guess asked what he, he did for a living. Bert Ward, he. First time I met him, he was in camp back, back to Kansas, and he and a bunch of guys w went together and leased a lot of uh, farmland and was raising wheat, wheat. But then he got into the construction and with some big companies, and like I said, he was went around the same out on a big job as a superintendent. Of course, I got out. I took went to school and took aeronautical engineering, but a week before I graduated, by the in California, Lockheed down the road laid off 250 engineers, and that was in '49 and the downturn. And so I went home, and got a job with Goodyear in their engineering department for two or three years, and I managed a limestone quarry for two or three years. And then I went to Cushman Motors and in their engineering and tool design and product design for 28 years before I retired. And I. Yes, Bert O'Fear, I don't know what he did. And Bob Goodwin, our bombardier that didn't go over with us, I think he was a mail, mail carrier in Salina, Kansas. Well, I guess I forgot Kelly. Kelly, when we bummed around, and Kelly told me, he says, when I get out of the service, he says, I'm not going to wear anything but white shirts the rest of my life. Well, I think he probably came pretty close to that because he had his own bank and had it was very successful. But he did come up, and he, Alice did come up and stop says one time, he was wearing a plain old polo t-shirt, so he didn't quite live up to his dream. As of uh, January, 2004, Jim White, or Jim Holcomb and his wife are, are both gone. Jim Wisely and his wife are both gone. Don Simmons and his wife are still doing good. Charlie Jones is, and his wife are both alive, but uh, Charlie's in pretty tough shape. Brzezinski, he's still going strong. He told us at the reunion he bought, has a bottle of cognac and he says, the last two of us are, that are alive are going to sit down and, and drink the whole thing. And I think he's planning on being one of them. And he probably will because he was the youngest one on the crew and I was next to the youngest. Rod Elliott Brand, his wife, are both living. Walt Kelly is gone, but his wife Alice is still alive. And Burt Ward and his first wife are both, both gone. But his second wife, Donna, is still living in Mountain Home, Arkansas. This is my 
military record and report of separation certificate of service. I'll read you a few things on it. I was released from the service 7th of November 1945. I was actually sworn in as an officer on the 4th of August 44. B-17 pilot with a 1091 rating. European, African, Middle Eastern theaters of operations with two bronze service stars near Air Medal and one Oak Leaf cluster. That was the uh, decorations and citations. And I guess basically that's what it says. That's a separation qualifi qualification record. It says, pilot B-17, piloted and commanded a crew of nine in a B-17 type heavy bombardment aircraft in accomplishment of 14 combat missions against the enemy with the 8th Air Force. Took off, operated, and landed under bearing flying conditions such as adverse weather, low altitude flying, and night flying. Ascertained prior to all missions and, and flights, aircraft have been properly inspected by crew members. Had thorough knowledge in general of local flying regulations. Acquired 675 hours military pilot training time. Re related civilian occupations, flying instructor, airplane pilot, commercial. Har Harley Strowman, he was permanent personnel over there. Uh, I've forgotten now, I believe it was an armament or someplace, but he had an 8mm camera and he took quite a bit of uh, film over there and he had it copied into VHS. So I'm going to put a little bit of that on it and kind of show you some of the air bases, what was around that area. So his, his voice will be on most of it, I think. in 1945. I am Harley Strovan, then armament officer for the 835th Squadron of the 486th Bomb Group of the 8th Air Force. I will try to narrate this film to the extent that my memory can cope with it after 38 years. Expect a few errors. This is Nissen Hot 17. This is my first home in the ETO. Have an under, I have a shot of myself here reading Yank Magazine in front of the hut. Next we have Captain McNeese, 833rd Squadron Bombardier. He's returning from Abolutions. This is the washroom and the water was cold. In the Jeep. My shop was located quite close. There's Captain Bornstein again, group armament officer. Civilians keep the blacktop road in repair. They spread sand and put fresh tar on it. And they kept their steamroller in very fine shape. The real antique piece. We're in the town of Sudbury, and first of all, I photographed the statue of Gainsborough. He was a famous painter that painted Blue Boy, and Sudbury was his birthplace. It was market day in Sudbury, one day a week. Booths were set up in the middle of the street, and everybody sold their wares from vegetables to tin cups and etc. On the river store that ran through Sudbury, there were always ducks and geese. And this is a pillbox, specially built in case of an invasion. In the town of Sudbury was one very old building. It was named Ye Old Moot Hall, one of the very old timbered buildings of England. This is a typical English barn. Could be set quite close to the highway. Very picturesque. This one dates back to 1818. 
And along the country roads are many homes, gardens, and so forth. This is one of the prettier scenes, hedgerows, all flowered, a nice herd of Holstein cows out in the pasture. This is just a few miles from our base at Sudbury. Uh, in the little town of Boxford, the cement items are to be set on the bridge in case of an invasion, and the little telephone booth you saw there actually takes care of a whole little village. They did not have private phones in their homes, or very seldom. Another large English home. This could be occupied by one family, but as a rule, they tell us there may be six or seven families living in it. Every little town had its church. This one, we read the main part of the building dating back to the 15th century. It's quite a famous church in Hadley. Us traveled back and forth from the line to the mess hall on bicycles, and all the huts had a lot of bicycles around them. Baguli from New Orleans, always clowning around. We needed that underwear in England. The flag here is flying over base headquarters of the 486th and showing quite close to it the English homes that were actually incorporated in our air base and the civilians lived on them. This is base headquarters at station 174. Now we have hoarfrost. This is when we have foggy weather for several days. This happened during the Battle of the Bulge, around Christmas of 1944. The Germans knew that our aircraft were locked in because of the weather, and they took that opportunity to do their, uh, gain back some territory in Germany and France. The hoarfrost is very pretty. After several days of dismal weather, the sun came out, and then I took these pictures. That is the 833rd site right there. Each squadron had its own living site. Now, these are contrails, very familiar site. The aircraft in formation, as they gained altitude, would leave all the contrails in the sky. Chastack, they were artists at this. If their hay was put up outside, they were very careful about making a haystack and thatching a roof on top to protect it from the weather. I believe this is the town of Lavenham, about seven miles from Sudbury, and our sister group, the 487th, was based near here. This street scene was used oftentimes by the British press to depict very old buildings is very old. Out in the country, Father, there is a, uh, another church. The base of the tower of this church dates back to uh, 900 to 1000 A.D. The slots in the tower were to protect from Roman invasion. Now we have a couple mills. England was dotted with many windmills in the early days. This is an old post mill. And here we have the Packingham Mill. This was near Thurston to the north of Sudbury. This mill is about 150 years old. Very intriguing. It was grinding wheat at the time. It is now quite a tourist attraction in England. It's a very good mill, tower mill. The farmer was busy putting up hay that day. We would remember that and what it was for. This is my armament shop. I welded a practice bomb in the roof for a sign. 47. Some of the pilots like to keep in practice in fighters, and so it was stationed at our field. Now, some of my boys are beginning to load 500-pound bombs into B-24s. Ordnance would bring the bombs out to us 
and they would be pulled near the ship. The tail fins would be screwed on after that. The bombs would be loaded and then fused. I think this is Lieutenant Clark from Ordnance. He was in charge of bringing all the bombs from the bomb dump to the aircraft each night. On bombs now. They were pulled up into the aircraft by electric hoist. This is myself. We're going up for a high altitude bomb rack check on an aircraft called Superstitious Aloysius. Very often our bomb racks would malfunction, but they'd work perfectly on the ground. And so we would sometimes take them up, here we are starting engines, we would sometimes take them up on a high altitude test flight to find out the problem. At high altitude we're dealing with temperatures of 40 below and this can quite often cause failures in the bomb rack system. We have just taken off now and you can see some of the English countryside. This is an RAF Spitfire landed at our base with some difficulty and several days later we were gassing it up and it was about to leave again. Occasionally strange aircraft would land because we were in an airport and if they were in trouble it was a salvation. These are A-20s, attack ships flying over in formation. Now this is the start of a typical mission. We still had our B-24s and they line up around the perimeter strip, one behind the other, and they take off at short intervals down the runway. As they run their engines up in the summertime in dry weather, they create a virtual sandstorm behind them. Now after takeoff, these aircraft are actually in sight and sound for a couple of hours. They're, they're gaining altitude and slowly pulling into formation. After the mission is over, later on in the afternoon, they're coming home. It's probably one of the first ships to land. It's called sweating them in and they will set watching their returning aircraft. Now I have a B-17 landing. We were in a, we were in a transition starting out with B-24s and then B-17s. This aircraft is landing with a feathered engine. Also, his brakes were shot away, and so he threw a parachute out, the tail gunner. It was his job to put his parachute out the tail to help stop the aircraft. There was some concern here because only the pilot chute opened and the main chute did not deploy. I suppose the gunner thinks, well, what if I had to jump with it? Aircraft landing here in trouble, he's off the runway but no serious problem. The first pilot to complete the missions in our group, I do not know his name, gives our field a buzz job. He's very happy and elated. And after his tour of missions, he can now get some rest from war. Here he is pulling up at the end of the field and making his final landing. Now I have our ships crossing over the field and beginning their peel off. This is where they go into their traffic, traffic pattern one at a time. We have an aircraft here landing with two engines out and a flat tire all on the same side. That's hangar number two in the background. However, the landing was very non-eventful. It was a good landing. One day a little gypsy moth, I believe it is, 
with some RAF students landed at our air base. They were lost, getting low on fuel. They were there here getting their bearings and being refueled. This is sort of humorous to fill up. One of the guys took his bicycle up, came back with a five-gallon can of gas. I believe this is Warrant Officer Hainer. Now we have another B-17 approaching the runway, and this would be a second division ship, I believe, with a triangle on the tail. Not sure why it was landing there. This is the operations control jeep, which flies around and gives information to the crews. This looks like coming in on a wing in a prayer. Actually, it's damage from a taxi accident. Now I have an aircraft that's landing in trouble. He has no brakes. He puts out a parachute from the tail, keeps his outboard engines running, and can therefore circle in the center of the field and keep some control. The aircraft just previous to this cut all of his engines, had no control, crawled up a bank, and at about one half mile an hour, crashed into the engineering shack, of which everybody vacated in a hurry. It was a little surprise to us when we saw who come out of the ship. It was uh, Major Cormier, commander of the 833rd, a little bit red-faced. There you can see our later markings, the three bands of yellow, the yellow tail with a square W. The fellow with the cigar is Pat Malone. He was head of the 833rd's Pathfinder outfit, which was radar. One night an aircraft taxied past our hard stands locked wingtips with one of our 835th ships and swung around into it. A small fire ensued. You'll see a lot of foam. That's a propeller nestled into the tail. And you'll also see underneath how the prop had cut shreds of the horizontal stabilizer before it stopped. picks one of those frequent, dismal mornings when the fog was upon us and the day's mission was on standby. To add to the scene, ambulance and cleat tracks take positions at the runway's end. My armors are nervous. They have worked all night loading bombs. If the mission is scrubbed, they will work most of the day unloading, for tonight's bombs may be the same or different. The crews wait silently by their ships, pulling the props through and awaiting orders from the control jeep. The crews would appreciate a scrub mission today, for they could go back to bed. They have been up since one o'clock for breakfast, briefing, and the hours of preparation before the final starting of engines. Cattle graze in the background. Now we watch a C-47 go over, towing a glider. Now the fog breaks, the mission is on, and the first B-17 takes off. The practice mission I flew on, we're starting number one engine. I'd like to dub in a little sound. And we line up behind the other aircraft. This is a, from the 833rd site approaching runway 25. Now we are on runway 25 and ready for takeoff.
As we take off and circle for altitude, we pass over a neighboring air base. There is our typical halo shadow crossing over the wheat fields. Formation, the lead ship would shoot at intervals flares to identify itself. We slowly pull into formation. This is not done hurriedly. It takes a lot of time. And once the formation is tightened up, no matter which window you look out of, you have airplanes. B-17s to the right, to the left, above, below, all over. faithful engines out there. It's our pilot and co-pilot taken from the flight deck. This is out over the wing from the radio operator's small window. Now we are back over the field again. Very below us, and we begin the peel off. Finally, it is our turn and we will pull the same maneuver, go into the flight pattern, and come in for a landing. On September 5, 1944, I flew on mission number 72, and this was the aircraft, 136. We are here getting ready for takeoff. I flew as observer on this mission because it was a low altitude Michigan mission, and it was to bomb Brest Peninsula. The occupation forces had surrounded Brest. They were on the continent. The peninsula was holding out because of heavy gun emplacements. There's a little interesting thing here. These, this mission, on this mission, we lost two aircraft. They collided after bombs away. And I believe that the aircraft that will be shown, uh, here we are, still forming. We will show an aircraft rising over the tail. And I believe this is one of the aircraft that went down. And there it is. It would be to our left and behind us. Tried my best to read the number on the tail, even with a microscope, and I cannot read it. We're now joining other formations and on the way across the channel. Here we are approaching the coast of France, and you can see uh, how the ground was pockmarked by the many bomb craters. channel. 
And faintly ahead, you can see the white cliffs of Dover and the shores of England. And this picture as well as my armament shop. And we're back on the runway again. Now, I took this film from the tail gunner's position on a takeoff. You can see how rough a ride the tail gunner gets. And also the landing on the same flight from the nose of the aircraft. This is Sergeant Sullivan from my armament section and myself. Uh, one afternoon we set up a caliber 50 aircraft machine gun and fired some new semi-armor piercing incendiary ammunition. We set up quart cans of gasoline in the embankment and fired into them. Red Cross donut wagon, her club mobile, came to our base about twice each week. It was a very welcome sight, and the crews and the ground personnel would rush over to get their free coffee and donuts. It really tasted good. This is the Green Hornet, stripped down B-17, parked at the 835th site, was used to fly combat crews to Scotland for R&R &R and other little errands that it would fly. Now we're, we are in London, and this happens to be Dickens Curiosity Shop and St. Paul's Cathedral showing some bomb damage in front. We were not supposed to take bomb damage. St. Paul's again, the typical double-decker bus, and now we are in Hyde Park, and this is a serpentine, the artificial river at Hyde Park with Buckingham Palace in the background. Soapbox speakers, which Hyde Park is famous for. They stand on the soapbox and talk about anything. This is the Marble Arch entrance to Hyde Park. I always quip on the two girls rushing across the street that a Yank was driving the truck. And now we're in Piccadilly Circus, that famous London spot. The statue heiress was well protected and covered in the center of the circus. over, we take a train back to our air base. We always had to change trains at Mark's Tay, which was about 10 or 15 miles from Sudbury. And here it shows how quickly you can evacuate an English train. This shows the engine being switched to our train that will 
then take us on to Sudbury. Many of our boys will probably remember this last little ride. After your weekend passes over and you go back to work. These are boxcars called goods carriers by the British, much smaller than our boxcars at home. Now, we're at Valley Wales. Aircraft from three different bomb groups are waiting for good weather. This is on the Air Echelon's flight home. We were socked in here because of weather for five days. And we could spend our time by walk walking to the shoreline, which was actually the Irish Sea out there. The war is over and we're flying all the B-17s back to the United States to land at Bradley Field, Connecticut. The Stornway is, I believe, it should be our last view of England and then headed towards Iceland. This is probably a sunset on the way to Iceland and then we have a sunrise between Iceland and Goose Bay in Labrador. Labrador after our 10-hour flight. Everyone was very happy to get on the ground. They were much more happy to be on the right side of the ocean. And they show it in these pictures. Our pilot of Red Raider was R.G. Chelton. And this, I believe, is the last shot that I took. If I may add a small note to this, I would like to mention Bill Collins, former 486 Association Commander and now editor of our group's newsletter. He gave his most active support in getting this film preserved on videotape. Thank you, Bill, and good day.